Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Hello, we're continuing our study in 2 Samuel. Today we're going to start the appendix section of 2 Samuel that's basically chapters 21 through 24. For this particular lesson, we're going to do 21 and 22. 21 is going to recall some of the things of David's life, uh, particularly the problem that David had connected with the previous covenant that Saul had not been true to. And then we're going to have a, a, a brief summary of some of the, uh, David's mighty men that killed some of the, uh, the giants of Gath. And then chapter 22 is going to be like a psalm. Matter of fact, it's repeated almost verbatim in Psalm 18. And it's going to show that although David had great victories, that it was God that was giving him these victories. So let's look then, if we could, at chapters 21 and 22 of 2 Samuel. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David sought the presence of the Lord. Now, we know from several passages that famine was one of the ways that God used uh, to uh, alert his people to the presence of sin in their lives and their need to turn from it. Probably the most famous passage is Ezekiel 14.21, where several things are mentioned that God uses. And then 1 Kings 17.1 will show how God uses famine. And of course, both of these go back to Deuteronomy 27 and 28, the cursing and blessing section of that book that really explains the rest of the Old Testament and how and why God acted with Israel the way he did. So when it says David sought the Lord, apparently uh, he's going to the high priest, possibly the Urim and the Thummim being used, or maybe he's going to a prophet. We know during David's time there's a transition from the high priest to the prophet as a spokesman for God. But however God spoke, God did speak to him about the famine and says, It is for Saul and his bloody house because he put the Gibeonites to death. Now, this particular event is not recorded of how Saul must have tried to wipe out this foreign tribe uh, from his own home area in Benjamin. Uh, later on, it would be called Gibeah of Saul, which shows that uh, it was part of, of his home place, and he was trying to rid it, apparently, of these non-Israelite inhabitants. But if we go back to Joshua chapter 9, we recognize that there was a unique covenant made with these Gibeonites in Yahweh's name. Now, it's true they tricked Joshua. It's true that there was a lot of subterfuge here, but they promised in Yahweh's name, and therefore it shows the significance and validity of the covenant. Some have said this is placed here to show that God loves non-Jews, but I think that's not as significant in context as God is, believes in, in fidelity to covenants made in his name, and I think that's the source of this. Now, although Saul's deeds are not recorded, it must have pretty well wiped out this group of people known as uh, uh, Gibeonites. So now look down in verse 2. It describes them not as the sons of Israel, but the remnants of the Amorites. Now there are two collective terms for the native tribes of Canaan. The Canaanites, always associated with the lowlands, and the Amorites, always associated with the highlands. So apparently this is a collective term for all the tribal groups. For we know from Joshua chapter 9 that they are not Amorites technically, but Hivites, which is another racial group. In different parts of the Bible, we can summarize these tribal groups with either the collective term Amorite or Canaanite, but sometimes in the, in the, in the Bible there's five tribal groups given and sometimes seven tribal groups. So Hivite is exactly who they are, but we're not exactly certain who that really is. Notice then it says in verse 3, And David said to the Gibeonites, What should I do for you? How can I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of Israel? Now, this idea of atonement, it means covering. It's the word kapur, the day of covering, Yom Kippur. But it's the three-root uh, radical of this Hebrew word, K-P-R, is also the same three-root radical of the word ransom or to pay a price. And some say that those two are related. So he wanted to know, what, would, what could I do as the king to get you to abrogate this covenant or bless us even in light of Saul's unfaithfulness to what he promised to God? And in verse 4, we see that they say that they had, really didn't have legal rights. They weren't really full citizens. They didn't have the right of compensation or the right of an eye for an eye. But now David's going to grant that to them, even though they're not full citizens, to try to 
to make amends for what Saul did. Now notice, if you would, in uh, verse 5. So they said to the king, The man who consumed us and who planned to exterminate us from, from remaining within the border of Israel, let seven men from his sons be given to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul. Wow. Boy, what a strange deal this is. It's strange because it looks like that the, the sons are bearing the sins of the father. And there are several places in the New Testament that it is, is said not to be the case. And yet, this is a special case. This is, this is the aspect of corporality, as all of us sinned in Adam. As when Achan sinned in Joshua 7, the whole Israeli army lost. There was a sense of corporality in Saul's family. Now, it goes back to uh, some of the promises of God that Saul's family would be, would be wiped out. And uh, maybe this is related to fulfillment of prophecy. I'm just not sure. Notice they're going to hang these sons. Um, well, there are some Hittite parallels of this, and you also might want to see uh, Deuteronomy 24:16 for another exception of this rule about that the sons won't bear the sins of the father. Now, hang them, has, this is an unusual Hebrew word. It's been translated in many ways. I'll give you an example. The Jewish Targums call this crucify them. But, of course, crucifixion was not known at this early date. Others say from the Jerusalem Bible, impale them. Now, that seems to be probably what it's talking about. If we go back to Numbers 25.4, it literally says in the Greek translation, to be exposed to the sun. And we would think after someone was killed, if they were publicly impaled, the curse of Deuteronomy 21-23 came into effect. And therefore, it was a horrible way for someone to die. Some other possible translations are, dismember them is what the New American Bible has. Sacrifice them is what the Peshitta has. And of course, that is going to be what happened. It's like they're dying to expiate this sin. And the New English Bible has hurled them down as from a precipice. And so you see there's much variety here. And here is a good example how comparing English translations on these very difficult Hebrew words can give us a, a, a semantical field or what the word may mean. And it, it helps us to kind of understand it. Now, before the Lord seems to be in a judicial sense, maybe even a sacrificial sense. These seven men are going to die uh, to expiate uh, the broken covenant. And then it says in Gibeah of Saul. That seems to be the very appropriate place for Saul's sons to die because Saul tried to kill the original inhabitants, the Gibeonites. Now, also notice that in verse 7 it says, But the king spared Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth, is, is we've dealt with in, in our study of Samuel, we're not sure if this was before David knew where Mephibosheth was and sent for him, or if David is just being loyal to the covenant that he had made with Jonathan. You might want to see for this covenant with Jonathan, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 3, 1 Samuel 20, verse 12, 17, 42, and 1 Samuel 23, 18. Maybe as Saul was unfaithful to his covenant in Yahweh's name, David is still going to be faithful to his covenant, his pact with Jonathan in Yahweh's name. And again, it may be a, a purposeful contrast between Saul and David. Now, notice if you would, we're given the names of these sons. It even mentions in verse 7, because of the oath of the Lord, which was between, between them, which shows you the contrast. Now, in verse 8, it names these sons. There are going to be two sons and five grandsons. Now, here are the two sons from Rizpah, Saul's only uh, named concubine. And then it's going to mention an, another woman. Um, let's see. She had born to Saul the five sons. Now, my, look at your Bibles real closely in verse 8. Mine has Merab, M-E-R-A-B. Now, the Masoretic text and most Greek translations of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, and all the different, it, it's different forms, like the Sinaiticus and the uh, Alexandrinus and the Vaticanus, all have Michael here. Now, Michael was the daughter of Saul given to David, who was later taken away from him and given to another man. And finally, David wanted her back, but because she laughed at him, because he danced before the ark with such joy and in his loincloth, she was forever barren. So how could Michael have sons? Well, some say that the Jewish Targums have tried to uh, gloss over this obvious error by adding the little phrase, uh, the fact that Mirab died, but that Michael raised her sons, and therefore they could be considered her sons. But I think that's probably uh, not the case. I think we need to go back to the fact that in 1 Samuel 18:19, that the husband mentioned here is the husband of Mirab. 
And I think there's just been a misprint, a mistranslation, a copyist error. And we probably should have Mirab here and not Michael, even though the Masoretic text and many of the Septuagint uh, um, manuscripts have that. Now, in verse 8 also, the Brze uh, Barzili is not David's friend, but another man by that same name. So they gave these two sons and five grandsons into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the mountain before the Lord, so that seven of them fell together. And that's why the New English Bible gets the word cast them down. And they were put to death in the first days of the harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now the fact they were killed together at a certain place before the Lord at a certain time that's related to the barley harvest seems to imply that the famine is, is no rain, right? And so they were, they were at a precise time at a precise place and all of them died together uh, shows the sacrificial expiatory nature of this event. And the beginning of the barley harvest would be in April. Now we learn from verse 10 that Rizpah did a very uh, courageous and compassionate thing. That she stayed there, apparently on the special mountain or hill or rock, and she was in sackcloth for mourning, and she stayed there apparently till the fall rains, which would mean she stayed there from mid-April to sometime in October. Now some say, well, that's too long. She couldn't have stayed there that long. And some say it started raining during the barley harvest to, to assure them that God had accepted their sacrifice and the famine was over. We're not sure how long she stayed. But she stayed there with these, all these dead bodies. She chased off the birds. She chased off the scavengers. And uh, she protected those uh, corpses. And uh, David heard about that, verse 11. And apparently it moved him. And he went and got Jonathan's and Saul's bones. Now, if you remember the story, uh, Saul was decapitated. His body was hung from the gates uh, of one of those cities. And... Um, the men of Jabeth Gilead came and stole the body because of, that Saul had been kind to them and buried them. Now David went to, this, to Jabeth Gilead and got the bones of Jonathan and Saul and came and buried them in Saul's home area. That was David showing an act of respect. Now some say David did that for political reasons so he wouldn't be accused of, uh, of uh, giving these seven sons of Saul over to be killed. But I don't think David's doing this for political reasons. I think he really cared for Jonathan and Saul. And so I think it's an act of respect. It amazes me that in about verse 14 uh, that the Septuagint adds that the bones of all the Gibeonites who Saul had slain were also buried with Saul and Jonathan. We're not sh certain of that. It seems to be an addition, uh, but it's an interesting side note that there was a larger grave of all the people involved in this uh, horrible account. In verse 15 it says, And the Philistines were at war with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him, and they fought against the Philistines, and David became weary. Now, why David was tired, is it, we don't know the chronological sequence of this appendix, chapters 21 through 24. Was David older? Uh, we're just not sure. Uh, but he became weary for some reason. Now, look at verse 16. Now, mine has, then, Ishbi Binob. But some translations, and I hope you'll look at some different English translations, say, or, or translate this way. And he captured him. And so... It's either a person's name or it's a Hebrew phrase for the fact that this man captured David and was about to put him to death. Now, it says this man is one of the giants. Uh, it's interesting that in my translation, the word giant appears in verse 16, verse 18, verse 19, verse 20, and verse 22. The rest of this chapter is kind of a summary of what happened to all these giants in Gath, these descendants of the Rephidim, sometimes called the Anakim, sometimes called the Nephilim. But here they're called, they're called the sons of Rapha. There have been two ways to look at this word giant. Some say it's just a descendant of this, of this kind of mystical people called the Rephaim who are identified with the giants. You might want to see Genesis 15.20. You might want to see Deuteronomy 2.11, Deuteronomy 3.11, and Joshua 17.15. Others say that it shouldn't be translated giant here, that the sons of Rapha might be a military order connected to the god of Rapha that was in Gath. And so it's either a military guild of warriors or the sons of these giants. And to me, I think it's giants. And it gave the weight of his spear here. Now, this weight's about eight pounds. It's about half the size of Goliath's spear that David killed. But it's still a large man, okay? You might want to see 1 Samuel 17, 7 for that. Uh, he was girded with a... Now, my, mine says a new sword. Now, look at your Bibles in verse 16. The word sword is in italics. The word here is another difficult Hebrew word. 
Uh, the Peshitta, the Syriac translation, and the Vulgate, the Latin translation, put the word new sword here. But the New English Bible says he was girded with a new belt of honor. And that, I think, is what it is. This belt of honor is something that David took from Goliath. And so maybe it was a kind of belt that these Philistines wore that showed, showed they were great warriors or maybe a member of this uh, a military guild of, of, of warriors. We're just not sure. Then it's going to say that Abishai, now he's, uh, he's Joab, the military commander of David's brother, a, a very gallant man. He saved David, protected him from this giant. Um, and the, the, the whole army said, David, don't go to battle anymore because if you die, the whole lamp of Israel will be extinguished. I think that's something that they recognized that David was not only the spiritual leader and military leader, but in a real sense, the very essence and heart of the people was because of David's relationship to God. And so they didn't want him to put himself in jeopardy anymore. Now in verse 18, we go to some other people who killed these same giants, and we have several people named. Uh, the first man is an inhabitant of the, uh, a city about four miles from Bethlehem. And he is one of David's mighty men, mentioned in 1 Chronicles 11.29. He also kills one of these giants. And then in verse 19 has been a great problem. It seems that a man named Elhanah uh, killed Goliath. Now, how could two of these brothers both be named Goliath? Would your mother name you Bob and Bob, uh, Bill and Bill? Well, I think Goliath and Goliath is kind of silly. Some say that this is uh, David's name before he became king. And when he became king, his throne name is David, but his given name is uh, El Hanah here. Others go to the parallel passage, and this is very important, in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5, that say that this man killed one of Goliath's brothers. Now, I really think what we have is the true text is in 1 Chronicles 20, verse 5, and what we have is another scribal corruption here, an early uh, copier's error, if you will, in the, in the Old Testament. So I hope you'll look at First Chronicles 20, verse 5, and compare it with this. Now, it mentions the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Many of us believe that that meant that it was not just how thick or big it was, because a weaver's beam is not that big, but that it, was, it had loops tied to it so that you could sling it with more power and get, get more of a ballistic effect out of it. And so it was because of, of the construction, uh, not of the size here. And then there's several other uh, giants mentioned through here and how they were killed. And notice in verse 21, this, this last uh, brother mentioned uh, defiled Israel, kind of like Goliath did back in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, verses 10 and 25. And so in verse 22, it says they were three apparently brothers related to the giant in Gath. Um, now, in, in chapter 22, we go into this beautiful psalm. It's almost repeated verbatim in Psalm 18 with slight differences. But it's to show that all these victories of David was really not just to David's skill, but really to the presence of Yahweh. So I hope you'll uh, follow with me. Boy, the earliest part of this psalm is so beautiful. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. All of these wonderful my's and I's show the personal relationship. Like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. David knew God. And all these beautiful pictures about a, a rock some say this rock it is the idea of the fortress of Adullam where David took refuge from Saul, uh, 1 Samuel 22, 1 through 5. Um, I, I really think this idea of rock is, um, is not that, but it's kind of a, the stability of God. Like God is a fortress up on a high rocky crag. And, and that's the, the thing here, the immovability of the rock or, the, or the, the, the fortress of the rock, something like that. Notice the word, uh, the, the shield, God is my shield. This is a beautiful metaphor of God as protector. God is physically present and fighting on our behalf. You might want to see uh, verse 31 of this very same uh, chapter. It's beautiful. Let me give you some other allusions to God as a shield. It goes back to the covenant between God and Abraham. Uh, Genesis 15.1, Deuteronomy 33.29. The word shield is etymologically related in Hebrew to the word deliverer. And I think we can see how beautiful that is. Then in verse 3 it says, The horn of my salvation. Now the horn has two possibilities. Number one, it's allusion to an animal horn, uh, a symbol of strength and power, and that to me fits the context best. You might want to see Deuteronomy 33, 17. But others say it refers to the horn of the sacrificial altar or the horn of the incense altar, which was the most holy part of that altar. You might want to see uh, Exodus 27, 2, Exodus 30, verse 10, 
1 Kings 1, 50 and 1 Kings 2, 28. Notice it says, uh, my stronghold, my refuge, my savior. He's just repeating these phrases, all that God was to him, that he did not face life alone, that God was with him and carried cared for him and protected him and garrisoned him and surrounded him. Oh, friend, don't you, don't you feel that way? Aren't you happy about that, that the way, that's the way God is? I, I think of 1 Peter 1 when I think of this. It's just beautiful. Uh, I call upon the Lord, this idea of call upon him in worship, uh, who is worthy to be praised. What a wonderful name for God, one who is worthy to be praised. You might want to see Psalm 48.1. Psalm 96, 4. What a beautiful name for God. And I am saved from my enemies. And of course, the word saved in the Old Testament means physical deliverance, not spiritual salvation. In verse 5, it has death uh, pictured as a, 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 a water overwhelming someone in successive waves. Notice the word destruction here uh, in the second part of verse 5 is really the term Belial. Now, originally that was two Hebrew words put together. It's the, the, comp, it's the preposition without and the word prophet. It, in, in the inner biblical literature, it came to be a title for Satan. Matter of fact, we can see that title for Satan in the New Testament, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. In verse 6, it talks about Sheol, the place where, 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 the, where the dead go, the, 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 the dwelling place of the dead, the grave. The New Testament counterpart would be Hades, mentioned in Luke 16, where the rich man was. Now, there's the, this is, a, of course, a Hebrew parallelism. The word cords in verse 6 and the word snares in verse 6 kind of personifies death as a hunter seeking to trap man. That's the idea here. Notice in verse 7 where it says, I will call on God from his holy temple. Now, that may be one of two things, his temple in heaven, or the Jews viewed God as dwelling between the wings of the cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant. And that may be the illusion here. We're going to mention the cherubim down in, um, let's see, verse 11, but I'll hold that discussion until I get there. Uh, notice it, the, the metaphor of a storm beginning in verse 8 and running all the way through verse 18. Several times in the Bible, God is see, seen as coming in a storm and nature's power. You might want to see Exodus 19, 16 as he came down on Mount Sinai and also Psalm 77, verses 17 and 18, a beautiful metaphor. In verse 9, it mentions that smoke came out of his nostrils. This is the, uh, this is the place, uh, the, the nostrils, the place in Hebrew where anger was, was located. You might want to see Exodus. Oh, excuse me. I don't have, an, I don't have a parallel for that. Excuse me. In verse 10, about uh, that God came down. That's very anthropomorphic. You might want to see uh, uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. He rode on the cherubs in verse 11. Uh, this may be the idea of the portable throne chariot seen in Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10. Others say no, it's the idea of the cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant where Yahweh dwells. You might want to see 1 Samuel 4.4 4 and Psalms 99.1. Um, there are many allusions here as God as a, as a person. Uh, the Shekinah cloud may be in verse 12. In verse 15, again, a parallelism. It seems to be a lightning referred to here. This seems to be a, a allusion to either the creation account or God uh, destroying the Egyptians in the Red Sea. I'm not sure. In verse 17, he drew me out of the waters. That's kind of a play on Moses' name and Moses' life history. You might want well to see Exodus chapter 2, verse 10. He put me in a broad place. Well, that's the opposite of the Hebrew word, a tight place, or a place of distress, a place of tribulation. He put me in a wide place. Uh, notice that in verse 20 through 27, David's claims of righteousness. This doesn't mean that David claims to be sinless, but he claims to be true to the covenant. This seems to uh, historically must have happened before his sin with Bathsheba. It's very difficult to translate these verses, but it seems to say that God takes the side of the humble, the dependent, the trusting person. And I think that's a beautiful way to put it. In verse 29, thou art my lamp. You might want to see uh, 2 Samuel 21, 17, where it's alluded to, and also beautifully in Psalm 27, 1. Um, let's see. In verse 30, uh, God gives David the supernatural physical ability like he did the judges in times of battle. Oh, I love verse 31. Thy, the word of the Lord is tested. Oh, you might want to see that. That's, that's a beautiful thing, that God's word can be stood on, trusted in. Psalms 12, verse 6. Psalms 119, verse 140. Uh, Proverbs 30, verse 5, and the beautiful passage in Isaiah 55, 11. Look at verse 32. For who is God besides the Lord? This is a strong statement of God's uniqueness, almost of his monotheism, but not quite. It's the idea of uniqueness. You might want to see, and, and uh, I think that's, that's beautiful. Notice that he's going to guide the person in uh, verse uh, 33. Uh, I think this, y'all see Psalms 139 of God's guidance. 
The idea that he makes my feet like hinds feet in verse 34 is the metaphor of stability or swiftness. Notice how beautiful in verse 36, the shield of, of thy salvation. Or in verse 40, he girds me with a belt. This reminds me so much of, of uh, God as warrior, saw, uh, Isaiah 57, that's picked up on this beautiful picture of the weaponry that God provides for the Christian in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. Verse 37, my feet have not slipped. That's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for sin. It's the opposite of stability, the word for faith. Uh, notice down where it says, uh, they looked to the Lord, verse 42. This may describe the fact that some of David's enemies were Jews who were calling on Yahweh, but Yahweh didn't know them. In verse 44 and in verse 50 is very interesting. The word nations appears in, in 44, uh, but really the Masoretic text has the singular, nation, which would refer to Israel. But then in verse 50, it's the plural. We get the plural from the Septuagint, the Targums. That refer to the Gentiles, that God does care about the Gentiles. And this is exactly why Paul quotes this verse in Romans 15, verse 9, that God, God does care for all the people of the earth. And I think you ought to go back and read uh, the covenant with Abraham again, Genesis 12, particularly verse 3. Verse 51 is very messianic. It shows God's covenant loyalty to his Messiah, his anointed one. And this is the promise that he'll be that, that come out of David's descendants, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Well, I've run out of time. I hope you'll read through this psalm and look at the parallels and go through my notes. I've really enjoyed being with you. God bless you. Have a good day.